Welcome to Betrayal Recovery Radio, the official podcast of APSATS, the Association of Partners of Sex Addict Trauma Specialists, hosted by Dr. Jake Porter. APSATS is a nonprofit organization providing professional training and compassionate support to partners affected by problematic sexual behavior and betrayal trauma. In each episode, Dr. Jake guides a conversation of enlightening insights and practical tools to empower those affected by sex addiction and betrayal trauma to use their voices and live their values. The mission of Betrayal Recovery Radio is to offer hope to those in need of healing and growth to those moving through grief. And now, here's your host, Dr. Jake Porter. Welcome to another episode of Betrayal Recovery Radio. I am your host, Dr. Jake Porter. I'm glad you are here. We're coming up on, actually, now I guess we're fully in the swing of this holiday season. And what happens at the holidays for many of us? We see our families. I'm very blessed to have a family that I actually enjoy being around. I know that for some people, it's quite a challenge, though, to spend time with family. And so today and next week, I'm going to be sharing with you one of my webinars that I did on the subject of our families of origin. Family of origin is a term that refers to the family system in which you grew up, basically. Uh, often this is mom, dad, siblings, but sometimes it can be grandparents, aunts, uncles, uh, and can extend out to teachers, other caregivers, neighbors who play prominent roles. And so my hope is that with some education and awareness, uh, it might allow you to move through these holiday uh, season, this holiday season and see your family and perhaps um, endure and, and get through it. So that's what I'm going to do with you this week and next week. I'm going to share with you uh, this webinar that I did called Unlocking Family of Origin Issues. Now, before I get into uh, this this webinar with you, I do want to remind you, if you're a new listener here and you don't know much about APSATS, uh, I want to encourage you to go visit the APSATS website, APSATS.org. APSATS is the Association for Partners of Sex Addict Trauma Specialists, and uh, among the many things that APSATS does is their cornerstone training, the multidimensional partner trauma model training, uh, which assists professionals, helping professionals in learning how to actually meet the needs of those who are suffering from betrayal trauma as partners of addicts. If you um, are a helping professional or someone who feels called to get into that work, I could not encourage this training more highly. Just go to the website. You can read more there. Uh, AppSets has other uh, stuff coming up here, some some um, webinars and that sort of thing. It's all listed at the website as well as a directory of AppSats trained and AppSats certified helping professionals. So if you're in need of support, go check it out, uh, especially during these trying, potentially trying holiday times. All right, sit back and enjoy this first half of Unlocking Your Family of Origin Issues. Unlocking family of origin issues or understanding family of origin issues. I'm, I love family of origin work. That's uh, not surprising to any of you who've done it with me. I'm, I'm really passionate about doing this work. It's special work. It's sacred work. And um, I get to here in my practice do somewhere between like um, uh, four to six family of origin intensives each year. Okay. Where it's either all men or all women. I do it with a colleague of mine, Delphi Medina, and we, we walk people through exactly what I'm going to go through with you today. And um, I'm a nerd. I'm a geek. If you know me, if you've done these uh, webinars with me before, you know that what I'm about to say is true. I can't help, but um, uh throw some big words at you and share with you, especially the neurobiological stuff. Uh, I have a strong interest in that. I know a lot of you do too. I get a lot of comments and positive feedback when I share that kind of thing. So my plan for today is we're going to, we're going to start with some more open, broad kind of introductory stuff, but then I'm going to move into 
like a very brief overview. It's going to be a deep dive really fast, but brief uh, of the neurobiology of family of origin work. What's really going on here? When we talk about an inner child, for example, when I have you visualize something like what's what's going on there? You know, what it, is it just a bunch of woo woo stuff or, or is there something real and important happening in the brain and in the nervous system and in the body? And it is. And so I want to just introduce you to that really quick. If I kind of lose you during that part, hang with me. All right, hang with me. Don't go anywhere because um, it won't be too long. And then we'll get back into a part that's a little, little easier to, to track with. And I'm going to give you a big overview of the model that I use uh, when I'm doing family of origin work with folks. So that's my plan for today. I hope to have a little bit of time at the end for questions. We'll see that kind of depends on how many um, uh, rabbits I chase along the way. Also, listen, if you have a question, please just put it in the chat box. Don't raise your hand, but that gets way too complicated for me. I can't do all of that. Don't raise the hand to speak. Just pop your question right there in the chat box. You can send it to me privately if you want, uh, or you can post it for every, so everyone can see it. But just do it that way. That's a whole lot easier. All right, we're going to jump in now to unlocking family of origin issues. Well, uh, you might have a family of origin if, for example, you find yourself imitating your parents in those ways you swore you never would. I'm never going to do what my mom did in that way. I'm never going to be like my dad in that way. And then all of a sudden you hear some words come out of your mouth or you reflect on uh, a reaction you just had to your kid or to your spouse or to a friend or a coworker or something. You go, oh my gosh, that was my dad made over. That was my mother made over. How did that happen? I swore I'd never do that. Well, if that's happened to you, you might have a family of origin. You might have a family of origin if, as we say down here in Texas, you're having a 50 cent reaction to a nickel problem. All right. I'm not trying to make light of things. I'm not trying to minimize, but I think it is a fitting phrase. You know, if your reaction to something is not proportionate to the very thing you're reacting to. Right. So, um, if it feels like there's lots of those proverbial straws that break the camel's backs in your life, where all of a sudden you kind of lose it and it, and, and you've, you've always thought maybe it's just that it's pin up, pin up, pin up. And then you, you know, like a pressure cooker finally explode. Maybe it's not that maybe there's something else. If you're having those 50 cent reaction to nickel problems, you might have a family of origin. If your relationships are filled with repetitive conflicts that make you feel like you're in the movie Groundhog Day. Love that day with uh, what's his name? Bill Murray. Uh, he's waking up. It's Groundhog Day again and again and again. And, um, and so if you find the same sort of pattern playing out again and again in your relationships, it might be the case, not that the universe is against you, but you have a family of origin. And the last one I have here is you might have a family of origin. If you're plagued with a sense of shame and or guilt that won't go away, no matter how hard you try. Like it's like uh, you've, you've, you know, you feel unworthy. You feel not worth it. You feel like you have to hide. You can't show yourself. You have to perform whatever it is. Lots of flavors uh, of that. But no matter how hard you try, it's never quite enough to get rid of it. Well, maybe that's because it's not yours to begin with. Maybe it's because you're carrying the guilt or the shame that was put on you by another person. So uh, if that's the case, you might have a family of origin. Um, so we're talking about just blaming the parents, right? I mean, that is what I'm saying, isn't it? No, that is not what I'm saying. You see, doing family of origin work is not about assigning blame. It's about uh, doing the work necessary to have awareness, to get clarity about the environments and the dynamics in which we developed as little people. OK, and the, in those very formative years, I think, generally speaking, are there are there cruel stories that make it very difficult to believe what I'm about to say? Absolutely. Generally speaking, though, it's safe to assume that parents did pretty much the best they could. That doesn't mean they were perfect. It doesn't mean they're not responsible for their errors. But generally speaking, I think parents do the best they can because you have to remember your mom, your dad, 
had their own families of origin. They had parents of their own who probably weren't perfect. Uh, they grew up in environments that were formative, that maybe were formative in less than healthy ways. Also, it's not just parents who are um, actors in our formative years. There are other really crucial people as well. I have a partial list here. Siblings, grandparents, aunts and uncles, cousins, neighbors, teachers, pastors, friends, classmates, random perpetrators uh, who, who, who violate us in certain ways. All of those people can also have an impact, leave a mark uh, on our formation in early childhood and into adolescence. And so it's not all about the parent, your parents. I have wonderful parents. They weren't perfect parents. I have wonderful parents though. Um, but I still had to do family of origin work. And uh, there were other, there were others in that cast of characters who left marks in my life in less than healthy ways. And so this really isn't about just blaming your parents. All right. Um, Another question that I get, and I want to go ahead and tackle head on. I originally had this toward the end, but I want to go ahead and say this right up front here. And that's about when it is that we should actually begin doing family of origin work. Like when's it appropriate? Well, if you, and, and, I, and I bring this up particularly because I know my audience, I know there's some of you on here, you just heard about a family of origin webinar. That's great. You're joining us for that. A lot of the people who follow uh, my work, a lot of the people who, you know, attend my webinars, I know that you're in recovery from addiction or you are married to someone who is an addict and hopefully in recovery from an addiction. And so with those specific folks in mind, I, I want to address this issue. If you've struggled with an addiction, you should typically begin addressing these family of origin issues after you get sober and after you've established a network of support. That's really important because these things are really hard. First of all, you're going to need that support, but also like the parts of the brain that you really need to access to do this work effectively, they're impaired if you're in active addiction. So by and large, if you're in active addiction, it's not the time to do family of origin work. Even newer approaches to addiction treatment that are trauma-based and that go ahead and delve into this, they will even say, it's not going to be a sufficient uh, level of family of origin work if you're jumping in straight from active addiction. You're going to have to circle back and do it again later after you've established sobriety and good recovery. Now, if you've experienced a more recent trauma, such as the discovery of secret betrayal, typically you should begin addressing family of origin issues once safety and stability has been reestablished and some initial initial healing from the betrayal trauma has occurred. So like if someone comes in to my office and they've just learned within the last weeks or even months that Okay, I lost, you guys lost me for a minute. I'm back though. Sorry about that. Uh, my, my internet went out on me. Hopefully, hopefully we will, uh, we'll be able to pick up now. All right, I'm back. Sorry about that. I don't know what the last thing you heard from me was, but let me just start with, if you've experienced uh, the discovery of betrayal, that's traumatic enough. It's not the time going to family of origin stuff right away. Instead, what we need is we need first to help you establish safety and stability. And, and then maybe later on, there will be an appropriate time in your healing journey to, uh, to deal with this stuff. Okay, good. I'm glad, glad y'all, y'all got me back now. So, you know, basically the bottom line here is that family of origin work requires certain capacities that are like like neuro neurological, biophysiological capacities that are just not readily available 
when you're in these compromised states of active addiction or recent psychological trauma. So it's not time yet. So if that's you, please listen, but don't dive into this stuff yet. Get sober first, get into recovery first, get some initial stability uh, back in your relationship, then come back and watch the replay again later if you're ready to do this kind of work. All right, so now jumping into the meat of it, what actually is a family of origin anyway? What is it? Well, it's, it's the closest system of people, all right, in which you were embedded during your childhood and adolescent years. So we're all born into context of relationships, embedded in relationships. That's how we come into the world, okay? This is often biological parents, but it doesn't have to be. It could be step parents, adopted parents, siblings, extended family. Maybe grandma lived close by or lived with you. It could be neighbors that you were really close to, primary caregivers, a nanny, a babysitter. Um, so it's, it's not limited to mom, dad, mom, dad, and siblings. It's anyone who was in that closest, tightest network, right? And certain, certain like families, as we think of them, mom, you know, parents and children, uh, invite others into that closeness. And so they, they might be a part of your family of origin work too. And I'm also going to add here perpetrators, random perpetrators who may not have been around a lot, but if they caused trauma that was that too much, too fast kind of trauma, an assault or sexual abuse or something like that, um, that kind of experience will probably be dealt with during family of origin work as well. Um, neuroscience and scientific research now makes it clear that the relational environment in which we were embedded, especially during our early development, has a formative effect on the way our brains develop encoding specific patterns of neural activity as responses to relational stimuli. In other words, the experience of relationships early on, okay, the early experience of relationships has a literal physical effect on how neural structures in the brain and then throughout the nervous system through the body are developed during crucial, crucial times in our lives. So there's, there's a, there's a relationship. So here's where I'm going to get into the weeds a little bit, y'all. So track with me. And if I lose you, just hang in there because we'll, we'll be back. There's a crucial relationship between our sense of identity and how we experience relationships and how we see others interact with us. Okay. Our sense of self emerges from the repeated relational experiences on which we come to rely as consistently predictable. So the way the other consistently is toward us, and then we, we rely on that and we respond in a way that we're expecting that, there's this reciprocal nature there, okay? A reciprocal nature there. So I'm just going to give an example. If a parent is scolding of a child who makes lots of noise, the child might learn to be quiet, okay? And then the, the quietness of the child is going to is going to influence the parent so that if the parent, if the child then isn't doing what it's the what the parent now expects the child to do, stay quiet, then the parent's going to react to the child not being quiet, which is going to reinforce the child being quiet. So there's this reciprocal nature. I'm not assigning any blame to the child because the child is a child but there is a reciprocal bi-directional influence going on. And, and so as an infant, the way I experience others uh, responding to me, mirroring me, um, the way they treat me, what, you know, how I experience the connection with them is the stuff from which my sense of identity is built. It, it provides the raw material out of which my sense of identity is going to be built. In the textbooks, this would be called the internal working model of self and other. So when, when we experience this enough, it gets organized and kind of encoded in our minds as this internal working model, a model of, hey, this is how others are. This is how I am. Okay. Um, so how I experience myself, it's going to be how I experience this 
caregiver in this relationship, this primary relationship. Now, a healthy sense of self comes from, and this is good news to all of you parents out there, good enough parenting, not perfect parenting. All right. Good enough parenting, just attuned enough to know when there's been a rupture in the attachment and to have some ability to repair that rupture. That's enough. That's enough. The problem is that some folks don't even get that good enough parenting because there's other stuff going on. And it's not always like because the parent's a bad person. It could be, you know, that uh, dad left and mom is having to work three jobs. Right. I mean, there's that's just as an example. OK. Now, going a little bit deeper, a self state. OK, is a version of us that is a context dependent internal working model of self and other that's activated by sets of memories, behavioral responses and perceptions. So in other words, we all have different self states. I'm in a certain self state right now. It's activated by what I'm doing. That's behavioral by where I am in my office, by memories of having done this before I'm showing up as a certain version of me, a certain self state. And the reality is that every single person is a unitary self actually made up of several self states. Okay. So um, if I showed up as this Jake, this self state Jake with my wife, that wouldn't be cool. She wouldn't like that. That would get old really quick. If I showed up as this self state with my daughter, she would end up needing a family of origin intensive when she's, uh, older. All right. Cause right now I'm in a certain kind of professional performative self state, but I can slide back and forth. You see in optimal development, our self states are regulated and integrated. They're, they're integrated enough. They're closely connected enough that I can move back and forth among them with relative ease. And, and, uh, and, and they're not so different that I'm, it's like a Jekyll Hyde situation, basically. Right. So though I'm in a different self state than I will be tonight at home with my wife, I'm the same person. Right. And, and I'm, it's, it's integrated enough that it's, it's, it's healthy. Um, after this webinar is over, I'm going to have a client come in. It's going to be a slight adjustment to my self state. Okay. So I might be father, husband, friend, son, counselor, but they're, they're integrated. They're regulated, regulated, meaning my whole brain is online, right? There's no sense of being out of control in, in that self state, but there's two problems. All right. Two problems to optimal development. Number one is that we're treated in ways that are less than nurturing. That's problem number one. So as we're forming this internal working model of self, all right. So we're forming that internal working model of self. Sometimes what we get is less than nurturing. That can be a problem. Problem number two is that we can be treated in different ways at different times or by different people. So um, I might be treated one way by one parent, another way by another, one way by um, the nanny and another way by the teacher, one way by my siblings and another way by my mom. And so what happens there? Well, what happens there is that we get, um, we get trauma reactions, which is what we're going into here. So, so let's talk about that phrase, less than nurturing. Um, I believe, and this is a hard pill for some folks to swallow, but I believe that when we receive anything less than nurturing consistently, not here or there, because again, all we need is good enough parenting for optimal development. But if consistently, if the norm is less than nurturing, that is traumatic. So what I'm saying is you don't have to have experienced like the death of a parent or a car accident or dad lost his job and you were living out of your car or something like that for it to be trauma in your childhood. Just receiving on a consistent basis over time, treatment that is less than nurturing is traumatic. And the, there's, there's strong evidence for this. You can look at children who, who are neglected and they're fed, they're clothed, 
parents around, but emotionally neglected. They're not mirrored. They're not played with. They're not valued. They're not cuddled. They're not affirmed. They're not viv like, um, what's the word? Where, where, where they're energized by the parents' energy, you know, the parents going to them and kind of pouring energy to, into them with light, lighting up their eyes, laughing, all of that. They've done, they've done uh, um, research and they've taken urine samples from children in those situations and they have much higher levels of cortisol and adrenaline going on. You can't see it on the outside. They're, they're, subtle, they're a little bit muted in their play, maybe that kind of thing but high levels of cortisol and adrenaline, which has an effect on the way the brain develops, the way the nervous system develops, the, may, the way other organs are developing. All right. So um, anything less than nurturing. And part of the, the problem here is that children are egocentric and, and they think everything is their fault, right? Anything happens, the children think that they did. It's, it's a magical thinking that we outgrow, but early on, that is how children feel. So if we come to expect, if we're in a situation as, as children, that we come to expect less than nurturing treatment and we internalize it as our fault, we're gonna, we're gonna begin developing these relational trauma, uh, trauma memories encoded in our mind. So for example, if our internal working model of other is scolding and impatient and demeaning and enmeshing, then the, the corresponding internal working model of self that will develop is I'm bad, I'm bothersome, I'm worthless. And, and, and to be uh, in relationship is to be suffocated. All right. Throw in any questions at any time. If you want, just pop them in the chat box. If you have anything. Now, this is complicated by the fact that we have multiple relationships, okay? So we can experience more than one trauma. We can experience more than one trauma from the same person, from different people. This type of relational trauma, this chapter of my life, but another one in a later chapter of my life. So it gets pretty complicated, all right? Hence the term complex trauma relational trauma extended over periods of time. It's layered, it's multifaceted. So dysregulated, disintegrated self states or say states are forged in trauma and are marked by these three things, which we're going to get into here in a minute. Automaticity, compartmentalization, and altered states of consciousness. So what I'm saying is like, I may have the father, son, husband, counselor, self states that are, that are working for me, but I've got this dissociated, disintegrated self-state called, for example, like in the lower left corner here, the lost child or lower right corner, the hero child. It's a, it's a self-state that emerged at a point in my development that was not integrated to the rest of me. So as the rest of me continued to grow and mature, that little pocketed, uh, isolated self-state did not continue to grow and mature. This used to be called developmental immaturity. Okay. Developmental immaturity issues, which we would now call relational trauma reactions. But the, the idea being that trauma stunts our development in these little pockets of life. Okay. So I'm an, I'm a, I'm a nearly 40 year old man most of the time, but then this one self state gets activated by something. And I'm all of a sudden a lost child or a hero child or one of the other trauma reactions out there. Now, what I said is that dysregulated, disintegrated self states are these three things. They're marked by these three things. First of all, automaticity, which is just a fun word to say. I rarely say it uh, well, but I'm kind of doing a good job today. So I'm going to stop right there. That means this. Rather than being flexibly responsive to internal and external environments, we are reduced to pre-learned scripts. So in other words, we're on aut autopilot and we're not really present. So, I, so once this gets activated, I'm no longer really, really present and really reacting to what's happening in real time. I am now an old script is activated and I am following the old script and I'm, I'm actually interpreting the present through the lens of the old script. OK, not through just an openness to the present, a flexibility to take in the present as it is. All right. That's automaticity. Compartmentalization. 
this is speaking of aspects of the self, models of self and other, and perceptions being fragmented from one's overall functioning and knowledge. So in other words, we aren't our whole selves. It's kind of a silly example here. All right, kind of a silly example here, but um, years ago I developed this phobia of leaving my coffee pot plugged in. It's a long story. It has to do with my grandfather's house burning down. And I was looking at a coffee pot when I learned it was a he heating element that the fire was probably started from and all of this. And all of a sudden I can't leave my house without unplugging my coffee pot. This one little thing, I, and here's the deal. I know that's not logical. I know that there are other things in my in my house that are worse fire hazards. I know that even if I left my coffee pot on, the likelihood of it starting a fire is very, very, very slim. I know all of that. That's in my integrated self, but I'm compartmentalized when I'm in that reaction, that trauma reaction. Okay, so it's isolated. It's out here. It's kind of like how I tried to draw these as being out from the whole, separated from the whole. And then altered consciousness. So our present states are dissociated from conscious consciousness leading to degrees of derealization and depersonalization. So in other words, we feel detached from ourselves into a reality. Depersonalization means you don't feel like yourself. Like it's not like you're doing it, but it doesn't feel like it's you doing it. It feels very, very much like you're separated from yourself. Derealization means that others around you and the environment around you doesn't feel real. Your reality doesn't feel real. Your contextual reality doesn't feel real. You feel detached from it or like it's, it's well, not real. I don't know another word there. All right. Um, so I, I got a, a question sent to me private, me privately. Is this why my husband feels scolded by me? He hears his mother. I, I can't say for sure. I don't know you or your husband, but it could very well be could very well be. If mother uh, scolded a lot, then a woman speaking in certain tones, having a certain uh, look in her eyes or facial expression, a uh, certain body posture could trigger this, these memories and activate that script. Absolutely. Okay. So relational trauma reactions, we experience these when an internal or external cue, like I was just saying, uh, could be a tone of voice or facial expression. It activates that dysregulated, disintegrated self state. So that was what I just said about uh, feeling scolded. The wife is saying something she's not scolding, but the husband feels scolded. It could be, I don't know for sure, but it could be that he's having a relational trauma reaction. There's a cue. Something is happening. It could be an internal cue, like a feeling in the body or, that sort of thing. It could be an external cue, tone of voice, something like that. And it triggers, all right, this um, dysregulated, disintegrated self state. All right. And so then what happens? I'm going to respond automatically according to my past experiences. And I'm going to respond in ways um, that my regulated, integrated self would not, my adult self would not respond in this way. I'm going to suddenly do that feels regressive in the literal sense of the word. And then number three, I'm going to be largely unaware of these responses and that they're so incongruous to my normal self. Like I'm not going to, I'm probably not going to be aware of it as it's happening unless I've done a little bit of work and therapy. You start to uh, become more sensitive to it as you do more work. So in summary, um, those patterns of thinking and feeling and behaving that hijack our lives, they're not merely just signs of weakness or impulsivity. They are learned responses to past threats encoded in our implicit memory. Implicit memory, that's like muscle memory, like tying your shoes, like playing the scales on the piano, like, uh, if, you know, fingering the chords on a guitar, uh, your golf swing. This is all in your implicit memory driving a car once you've done it a thousand times. It's automatic. It's largely non-conscious. It is learned. All right. It is deeply learned. That's what is really important to get here. Okay. Now the, the model that I use um, for family of origin work is called 
post-induction therapy. It was developed by Pia Melody. So everything from here moving forward uh, is either straight from or builds on the work of Pia Melody, who was at the Meadows in Wickenburg, Arizona uh, for many, many years. And um, I feel super privileged. I was actually trained by Pia Melody in this model. Not only was I did I attend her training, I was her guinea pig. I was her demo client. And uh, she has us, if we're willing, actually work on real stuff. So not only was I trained by her, but I was actually worked on her using this model. This is the model. Um, most of you know I'm in recovery myself. And when I started into recovery, my very first therapists were also trained in this model and used this model um, for, for my work. And so I knew it as a client before I knew it as a clinician. And then even as I was learning it as a clinician, I was experiencing it as a client from Pia herself. So post-induction therapy, often called PIT, it's an inner child model. And that may or may not make sense to y'all. I'll talk about it more in a little bit. It's a reparenting model, which again is another term that you may or may not know. And we'll get into later. And one of the things that I like about it is that the more research comes out from developmental neuroscience and our understanding of complex trauma, it fits. Like Pia, uh, she would say that God gave her the model. Um, I believe her on that. Um, and that she developed it working with clients and, and through her own healing experience and all that. And here's the deal. It seems that most of it, not all of it, and there are pieces that I change in light of recent research, but it seems that most of it really does align and fit with what we're learning from developmental neuroscience and from our understanding, our growing understanding of complex trauma. So here's the big picture, all right? Big picture of Pitt. Every single human being is born with a certain nature and needs to be treated accordingly. We call this the nature of the child. And I'll go ahead and tell you the five aspects of the nature of the child. We're gonna go over these one by one in a minute. Valuable, vulnerable, uh, imperfect, dependent, and spontaneous and open. That's the nature of every child. And we, we need, what we need is to be treated accordingly. All right. That's what we need is to be treated accordingly. When we're not treated according to our nature or those aspects of our nature, certain core issues emerge and these core issues move us to live in extremes. Okay. So feeling better than or less than, one up or one down, being completely in, invulnerable, like nothing's getting in or way too vulnerable, everything gets in. All right, these, these core issues emerge. From those core issues, we experience these secondary symptoms inside of us, all right? And we're gonna go through what those are. And those then show up in our relationships as the interpersonal symptoms. All right. Now, what we experience in, in relationships, remember, our sense of identity is connected to how we experience relationships. So now what these interpersonal symptoms are actually going to do what? Reinforce our core issues. OK, so it started at this point in childhood, but then as it gets lived out, it gets reinforced over and over and over. You've been listening to Betrayal Recovery Radio, the official podcast of AppSats. If you've received help or hope from this episode, I encourage you to share it with someone you know. If you've not yet done so, please subscribe to our podcast on your favorite listening platform. Thank you for joining us. I'm Dr. Jake Porter, and you can always email me directly at jake at appsats.org. I'd love to hear your ideas, questions or comments about the show until next time keep choosing to use your voice and live your values it's good for you and for this world